Hi, this is Bill Knauer for Author Magazine, and I'm here in Seattle, Washington with John Lanchester, author of The Wall. Hi, Bill. Thanks for having me. Can you remember, um, going back to your childhood, if, if it goes back that far, when you first recognized that you were just interested in stories, period, just stories of any kind? Well, I, I was an addicted reader from a very early age. I'm an only child. I grew up mainly in Asia. Um, mainly in Hong Kong, but we moved around a lot. Um, and um, you know, this isn't a sob story. Um, I had a very happy childhood, but I was, you know, was that fairly um, solitary kid who just reads all the time. Yeah. I mean, properly all the time. So I have great difficulty explaining to my children, um, you know, about there being no television, not just sort of limited <laughs> television, but literally not being any television, because there wasn't lots of places we lived. And then there was, you know, black and white TV that was two hours a day. And, right. um, and now they complain if the speed of the wireless bro broadband drops below 30 megs a second, you know, it's, <laughs> it's kind of hard to get that one across. Um, uh, so I was that person. And then the thought of actually sort of making stories, making things up and, and wanting to be a writer, I, th I think I remember from about the age of about 10. That's the average age. That's interesting. Nine, ten. That. Yeah, it's just that see, there's something that wakes up on us if we love that we we begin to see ourselves different. I don't know. Some of them start at five or three. You know, it's the unusual, but usually it's around nine. You say right. That's when I I I think I'd like to maybe take a crack at this. And I think it's something to do with realizing that there's someone who makes stories up. Yeah. You know, as it were, a story is not a given thing. It's a thing that um, actually somebody somebody creates, somebody makes. And I remember that had. Yeah, immense appeal from, from about that age onwards. So let's go back to that moment where you started your first novel. Your, uh, had you been writing fiction sort of secretly on the side, dabbling in it a little bit through college and then in the beginning of your profession? Not really, no. I mean, I think my plan basically was to... So I had the idea for the book in about 1990. It was my first novel, The Debt of Pleasure. And I think for you know, quite a long time, I, my my plan was to wake up in the morning and find that I had written it. Yeah, that was your big plan. That's, that's how I thought it worked. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, and I can exclusively reveal to your viewers <laughs> yeah, that doesn't really work. Well, it hasn't worked yet, anyway, I feel like that. Um, so, um, and then it kind of gradually, reluctantly um, realised that I was actually going to have to write it. I suppose partly because in a sense it's a high concept novel. It's a, it's a, um, it, uh, sort of pretends to be a cookbook, but it's actually a, a story, a sort of murder story. And partly because the idea was quite complete, in a funny way, I wasn't having to grapple my way toward, if I'd had to fight my way towards the central idea of the book, I might have got started working on it earlier. It's an odd thing, because the idea was fairly complete. You could just sort of see it. In I could sort of see oh, it, and oddly enough, that slowed me down in starting. It wasn't as interesting to you, maybe, or it wasn't as... That's fascinating. I've it never is. heard oh, that. Uh, but I think it's also, and then I was taken by surprise by when I did get started because I knew there was various rules about what the character's voice had to be like because he had to sound, when he's talking about food, he's a crazed foodie. You had to believe him when he's talking right. about it. And then when you realize it's something darker, you had to actually believe this darker thing. In fact, he's a cool serial killer. <laughs> um, and it's, but it's black comedy. And so though, in this, it's almost like an algebraic thing for what he had to sound like. But I couldn't actually sit down to write it, and I couldn't actually hear the voice. So the process of writing that was it was, um, it was it was almost like um, trying to tune in a radio, and you know yeah. there's a frequency out there somewhere. And then eventually, when I picked it up, I could suddenly hear him. I had a, a single sentence that was like, in fact, it was called, there is an erotics of dislike, which is about halfway through the novel, and it was like bang, I've got the radio station there, yeah. and I can start writing. And then the actual writing went quite quickly. So it's a weird process. It took years and years, of which quite a lot was failing to write. And then once I actually got going, it, it, the problems solved themselves quite fast. Uh, I like to listen to a podcast by an American named Preet Bharara, who's, a, uh, yeah. who's got a wonderful podcast, and he's just got a book out now. And, he, and I've been listening to the podcast, and he keeps saying, every podcast, the hardest thing I've ever done is write this book. The hardest thing I've ever done is write this book. Does that resonate with you? One of the main things I've learned was to sort of ignore the mood swings because you do get, yeah. you know, it takes a long time to write a novel yeah. and you do get ups and downs and you, you, you do, and, and the ups and downs are just the same as they ever were. It's just you, you, you sort of get used to not getting used to them, yeah. if you see what I mean, you know, that you learn to, it's almost a Buddhist thing that as were, you know, the feeling comes and, and then the feeling goes yeah. and you, you learn to let it sort of pass through you. I always tell 
my students that what, what you went through writing a book, because you will go through something from yeah. discovery, that belongs 100% to you yeah. and will always be yours, yeah. but the book does not belong to you. Yeah. It's almost like they've read a different book, and it really is theirs. Yeah. Their version of is theirs, not yours. But, and, and I've always taken great comfort from that. I like that because if everybody, if you had full control over the reader's reaction to the book, yeah. you have control over the writing. If you had control, that it would mean it was dead. Yeah, that's right. You know, that's it's right. The, it's, the, it's the fact that people take different things from it, read it in different ways, misread it if you want from your point of view in different ways. That means it's alive. That's right. And, and you know the the, the I often think that you know because I spent ten years working in literary journalism, um, you know deeply involved in that world of literary criticism and all that. And at the same time, at some level, part of me thinks that it's it's all a mistake. You know, I, I was once had friends who, uh, who lived in Spain and they had a guy who would help with, in, in the deep south of Spain where it was very hot and they had a guy who would help with their garden and he would, when he would talk about plants, he would you'd point to something and he'd say seco, meaning dry, meaning dead, or verde, meaning green, which is alive. In Andalusia, you know, the word for a living plant, interesting, it's just green, yeah. verde or seco. And I often think that it's either verde or seco. It's alive, it's alive or it's dead. And everything else is just sort of secondary and doesn't really matter. And in a way, if you're arguing or debating a book, it means it's alive, That's right. irrespective. Of whether you of like it or not. Are, you yeah. don't like it, saying, you know, I absolutely hated <laughs> the corrections because. <laughs> right, you know, right, right. No, well, that actually means it's alive. I like that. You know, I, I actually, I know you worked in literary criticism, but I think for authors, it's a very dangerous grounds to tread the world of criticism because you're putting yourself in the realm of what other people think of your stuff being important. And the truth is, I, for me, I cannot get into the zone of writing that I want to go into until I forget to give a damn of what anyone's going to think about it. The moment I start thinking about it, it's over for me until I forget. I don't know if that infiltrates your world or not. I think that, if you, I think that level of compartmentalization is sort of essential to it. Um, I don't know how to do it otherwise. Yeah, yeah. I do, um, and I think perhaps it's one of the things that does stop some talented people writing, that they can't compartmentalise from the... Because con- you need the critical and editorial part of your being to perfect a book and to edit a book and to rewrite a book. You know, it's yes. not that that part of you is completely irrelevant to the process. It, it is relevant, but not when you're... In, not when you're in flow, not when you're trying to get it down. Um, you have to just put that part of yourself away. And, and I personally, what I do is I don't, I don't, not only do I not rewrite, I don't read what I've written. Oh, you don't do the until, read what you wrote the day before thing? No, I get oh, to the end really? of the draft. I get to the uh-huh. end of the draft. Because I have a fairly extensive, I think, arsenal of editing techniques. Right. It's literally my job. And, right. I'm, and I'm unafraid of editing and, and then, and, you know, having to take the hood off and fix things. Um, but once I let that part of me loose, I, you know, I, I can't stop until it's done. Right. So my, and I'm not saying this is the only way to do it, but it, it is my process, is the first, first draft is only forward, mem- only okay. forward momentum. Right. That's probably good. And then, you know, as it were, um, either the Hulk turns into Banner or Banner turns into the Hulk for, right. for part two. All right, John, I got one more question for yep. you. What I'd like you to do is finish this sentence. If writing has taught me anything it's taught me what I think the, the main thing it's taught me is my books are very different and that I think the our Western conception of the self makes too much of the idea that we're a fixed unified thing across the our whole of our lives and I think that's in the Humean or Buddhist version of the thing, that's a kind of trick of memory. I think, so if writing's taught me anything, I think it's that we change a lot and there are very profound senses in which we become different people across the course of our lives.